Hallelujah. Give you praise. Let's see. So last week we, we were really focused on the kingdom of God. We really focused in last week on citizenship and be, becoming a citizen. And once, how many know once you, once you got birthed into the kingdom of God, you became, automatically became a citizen. But what we really honed in on last week is what does that mean to be a citizen of God? What does it mean to be a citizen? And what rights and privileges are yours now that you have become a citizen? Okay. And so that's where we kind of took it last week. So, uh, let's see. I want, I want to see where I am. A powerful draw, I talked about that. Government politics, Bible, not being a love letter, right, necessarily, because a lot of people think that. It's a, it's, it's a powerful tool, uh, the Word of God. We were conveyed into the kingdom. Um, good, let's go down, and, and here's what I want to talk about today. And I'll start with this, is culture. Culture, okay? Culture. Culture is whenever people's, whenever you develop a people's way of thinking and moral acceptance through formal instruction and informal modeling. Okay, you understand? You'll have what's called the cult, a culture. You could be raised in a particular culture. It could be in your family type of thing. And so that will model your way of thinking. Okay, you'll see how things are modeled, you understand how to do things, and it's what we call certain things, even in, in our society, have become what we would refer to as culturally acceptable. Culture, but not everything that's culturally acceptable is biblically acceptable. You understand what I'm saying? And so we, that's where, in being in the kingdom of God, we need to understand that. And also, becoming a part of the kingdom of God, there's a culture there. Okay, so you begin to develop that culture amongst Christians and other believers, and, and, uh, and in churches, there's, you, you start to create a culture. We like to, one of the things that you'll recognize that we've, we have a culture here, we have a culture of freedom in, in this church, we have a culture of joy in this church, we have, a, we, have a, we have a culture of faith in this church. There's an expectancy, you know, we, we have a group of people, uh, a large percentage of people who just believe that God's word is true. And you say, well, shouldn't all churches do that? <laughs> yeah, I think so, they should, but you kind of find that you go places sometimes, or you get around other believers, and you find out that they're not really believers. They say, well, are you a Christian? Yeah, well, do you believe this or that? Well, I'm not sure I believe that. Well, you know, God's word says that, yeah, but I'm not sure I believe that. And so you find out that that's not always, you know, that's not always part of the culture they were raised with. And so uh, we want to be, as, as believers, we want to develop that culture. You, wanna, you want to have that culture in your home. You know, one of the things that I said that you, you, as parents, you, not, you, you must not view the church as the place to have your children taught the Word of God. It's a place. And they should be taught the Word of God in church, but that shouldn't be the main place. If that's the only place your children are hearing the Word of God, then, then, um, then the parents aren't doing their job. Because according to the Word of God, it's the fathers, and, it's the, you know, and we could take it now to the mothers, but in the Jewish culture, okay, they were to be taught at home. They were taught at the dinner table. They were taught at, while they were working. They were taught around the home. They were taught. They, it was modeled for them. Uh, you know, God said, what, what, he explained, I, I, I forget the exact scriptures, you know, I think they're in Deuteronomy, but when you walk by the way, you teach your son, you teach your daughter. When you're doing these things, you teach, okay? You're always looking for teachable moments, and always look, you know, I'm doing it constantly with the, when I'm coaching track, I have the, you know, the kids on the track team, and over there last night, we're at a meet, they're over there, they're warming up, oh, I don't know, coach, I don't feel good, I don't think it's going to go, I said, hey, we're going to start lining our speech up right. Let's start speaking faith. Let's start speaking like that. Like you're going to be, like, you know, kind of like, well, you know, if, if the worst case scenario, this is going to happen. I just feel this is going to be good. And I said, yeah. you know, well, according to, according to what you say, according to what you believe. So we've got to start turning that around a little bit sometimes. And so you as parents or even, even in your workplace, you have opportunity. Sometimes it's a little more difficult. You have to do it a little more subtly. Uh, you start training those around you. You can model it. Okay? You can model it. And that creates a culture. Do you ever notice when you go places or you go, you know, you start working in a, in a particular environment, there's a culture there. There's, there's a, 
There's just things nobody has to say what to do or what not to do. You just kind of learn it by being around. You learn what's acceptable and what's not acceptable uh, by what's modeled. That's the same thing that happens in the church, okay? You start to learn what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, okay, through a culture. Uh, Parents and society will teach children the culture and children will begin to live it. We're not born with culture. It's learned. It's learned behavior. Nobody, do, you, do you understand that nobody's born a racist, right? You know, nobody's, birthed in a, nobody's, nobody's born and just automatically they're a racist just because of the way they were. That's not it. Racism is learned. Do you understand that? Where's that DVD? Let me, I, while, I'm, while I'm on it. Has anybody seen this? It's a documentary. It's just out now. It's called Uncle Tom. Okay. Uh, it's out. I think you can, there, I know if you're streaming, if uh, Amazon has it, Netflix probably has it. I don't know. If, uh, anyway, uh, I would recommend watching it. I watched, Tammy and I watched it last night. Okay. And it's, a, it's very well done. It's a documentary uh, called Uncle Tom. Um, I'll just say this. If you're a racist, you won't like it. But um, it's, a very, it's a very good, it's a great documentary and uh, a good way uh, of things to accept. There's a lot of good, uh, who, Ellen West, Elder, Sowell, Cal- Candace Owens, a lot of them are on there. It's all, it's all real good. It's, it's excellent. Excellent for a mindset and, and things to, uh, to get a hold of. Do you think it's a good mindset how to pray? How to pray for this nation and things. Yeah, I'd recommend that video. Uh, so, so anyway, culture is something that's learned. It's learned behavior. Uh, sometimes particular where you live in a particular physical location can mold the culture. Okay, in other words, in other words, okay, if you lived in an area that was very fertile, how many know there's probably a good culture of farming in an area like that? If you live in a mountainous area, you're going to have a different. If you live on a coast, you're going to have a culture of, you know, probably seafood and fishing. And, you know, you're going to learn those kind of things. If you live in a jungle, okay, or a tropical area, you're going to have a completely different type of culture. You know, you might get into surfing or swimming and things like that. And it's going to be different. That particular area or location is going to help begin to mold you and have your views based on that culture. Because you can see how an environment affects culture. How many has ever seen the movie Trading Places? Okay, a couple of you. Some of you didn't want to admit it. Okay, but uh, Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte, right? No, Eddie, no, that was another one. Dan Aykroyd and, yeah, okay, yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's, it's a pretty good movie. So, it, and explains that, you know, the culture and things like that. Okay. Language. Every nation has one major language, okay? And your language, you understand that language is the key to unity? Do you remember in the Word of God when the languages were confused? What, what did it do? What does, it, what does multiple languages do? It brings division, okay? So in the Word of God, we have an, uh, where where the languages were divided. You remember that? They were divided. Yeah, Tower of Babel. The languages were divided, and therefore the people... Con- guess, what, guess who you're going to congregate toward? People who speak the same language. Well, see, in the church, there's different languages. You understand? See, some churches really have a language of condemnation and guilt. That's their language. They have a language of religion. Other churches have a language of, uh, of faith and a language of freedom. and a, they, they just speak that language. You can start get around those people and have that kind of language. Telephone. <laughs> That's what my dad always, my dad always did. <laughs> yeah, culture. We were raised with that culture. So. <laughs> as soon as the telephone rang, he screamed it out. Telephone, telephone. So. <laughs> yeah, we all hear it. Okay, so anyway... Um, the language, you'll, you'll, you'll tend to congregate toward those who speak your language. Does that make sense? Bishop Clarice says this, uh, and she said, those who have every, revel- every revelation will bring a revolution and a new set of friends. And so once you have that, once you have a particular uh, area, you know, how many, 
How many have gone to, well, let's just say this. How many has ever gone to a church or you were raised in a church that they, they did not practice the gifts of the Spirit? They just, didn't, they just didn't do that. They didn't practice the gifts of the Spirit. Didn't believe that healing was for today. You know, didn't see miracles. Didn't see signs and wonders. Didn't talk about stuff like that. Okay, so, but how many know once you had a revelation from the Word of God that these are for today, right? It's hard to stay somewhere where your circle of, uh, of friends and believers don't believe that. It's not that you're not friends with them anymore. It's not that you don't love them. You can't associate. It's not that. It's that you're going you're gonna to find those that speak the same language. You're going to eventually look, you know, you're going you're gonna to be drawn toward that. You're going to be drawn toward people who are speaking that language now that you've come into a new understanding or things of God. Does that make sense? Okay, once you've experienced something like that, that that's what happens with the culture. Culture creates that. Under certain cultures, there's, there's, uh, there's laws, ways of doing things. Laws for protection and security, and laws are for, uh, to bring peace and order, okay, not division. There's symbols, okay? Under particular, there's, you know, you, we understand what certain symbols mean, right? Okay? If I throw out a symbol, we know what that means, right? Could be peace, could be victory, right? Good symbol, Right? Throw up a finger. I throw up another finger. That's another symbol that I probably <laughs> don't want to throw up here in church. You know what I mean? So, you know, certain symbols, that, you know, everybody kind of universal in the culture, people recognize, right? And so you just kind of, uh, you know, you learn, you learn those different symbols. We have flags. Every, every nation, every nation has a flag. You know that? And we have the flags of every nation in this hanging here, all 200 nations. Uh, so everyone, even the church has a flag, even the church has a particular, you know, symbol. We have symbols in the church of, uh, we know, you know, what's our major symbol? What's the major symbol of the church? The cross, right? The cross. And when we see that cross, what do we think of? We think of what, you know, that everything was central around that cross. Everything that we have received, everything is because of the cross. And that cross is just, you know, we wear, we wear necklaces with crosses on. We have rings with crosses on. We have crosses on our buildings or on our roofs. And, I mean, we just, it's the universal symbol of Christianity is that cross and what that cross meant because that's where our God died. But it also, when we see that cross, we don't see him on it because he's not there anymore, right? We understand that we're serving a living God. That, that, that cross, that, uh, when we see that cross, we, think, we don't just think of his death, we also think of his resurrection. We know that that cross was not the end, right? It was the beginning. Okay, so we see, we see that. Those symbols mean something. We have customs. There's certain ways you do things. There's certain ways you do things, okay? And, and uh, there's certain ways you dress or certain foods you eat, you, you know, in the culture. You get around different cultures. It's kind of fun. How many how many's ever attempted to try, you know, different foods? Some people don't like that too well. They're like, I'm not going to try something different. I'm like, try something different, you know? Who knows? And the culture, you learn certain things. And, and did you know that certain things that you like, that it's, that, did you know that even your foods are learned behavior? You can learn it. You'll learn uh, out of different cultures while, how they're able to eat hot stuff. And you're like, I can't eat hot stuff. Well, that's true. Maybe you can't eat hot stuff. But if you were in that culture, you could if you were raised with it. Say you could eat it. Uh, same thing. And so they have different, different tastes, and tastes are something that can be developed. Okay? Your palate can change based on the types of foods. You might not like a particular food, but you can learn. You know, when, how many mothers ever said, well, learn to like it? You know? Guess what? There's truth in that. You can learn to like stuff. Something you might not like, you can learn to like it. Okay? Because it's a trained process to, to learn that. Okay, so same thing happens in the kingdom of God with the things that we're partaking of. How many know we're partaking of the Word of God? How many know there's some things in here sometimes that don't sit right? They don't taste good. You're like, man, I don't like that. I don't like the flavor of that particular chapter. You know, I don't like the flavor of that particular teaching that, 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 that Jesus taught. I don't like that flavor. Well, guess what? Because you're in this culture now, because you're in the kingdom of God, you, you start to learn to like it, right? I've had to learn to like things that are in the Word of God that I didn't like before. There's things in there that I just I wasn't sure about. This didn't, didn't like it. You know, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, you know, it told me I wasn't allowed to do things that I wanted to do. And, uh, and, but I had to learn, right, to adapt to what the Word said. And I learned to like it. And I learned to make it mine. Amen? That's what we do with God's Word. We, make, we put priority on it so we learn to like it. And we feed on it, and it's good. It's good. 
How many know sometimes it's not so good? And you know, you guess what happens when things aren't good? You know, we, we call it in here. You've heard me teach this before. It disagrees. It disagrees. How many know sometimes, sometimes the Word of God disagrees with you? And whenever that happens, something has to change. Okay, you have to, you have to, you have to change. I mean, God's word is not going to change. So you have to change when there's a disagreement. When there's a disagreement, sometimes it causes an unsettling in the stomach. It, it upsets the stomach. How many know there's a war that goes on inside? That war is between spirit and flesh. It says, okay, there's a war that goes on inside the belly, okay, or inside your inner man, and that's with the things that you so that you do not do the things right that you wish to do. I think the scripture says, right. You're led by the Spirit. When you're led by the Spirit, that means you make a choice to crucify the flesh because they're at war with one another. And there, if you don't, see what's going to happen? Sometimes you start feeding on the Word of God, and guess what happens? It upsets. Just like, just like food, certain foods you eat disagrees or upsets your stomach. You'll read the Word of God, and it'll be upsetting, or it'll, it'll disagree with you, and that's when a change has to be made. Okay? You don't, you don't want to get rid of the... You know, you don't want to get rid of the Word of God, the food. Okay, it's good. It's nourishing. But if it doesn't agree with you, you're going to have a hard time receiving it. And so that's where the mindset has to come in to try to train. You know, that's the renewing of the mind to accept what the Word of God says and say, hey, this is good for me. I know it doesn't feel good right now, but that's, how many know that's, that's part of God's discipline? Hebrews chapter 12, no discipline feels good at the time, but it's good to train it's good to be renewed upon. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we get the discipline of God and we allow it to transform us. Okay? All right. Praise God. So we've been trained, a whole new culture. Whoever, whoever controls the minds of the people controls the culture. Okay? Whoever controls the minds of the people. That's why the mind is so powerful. That's why it's so important what you believe, what you think, what you're not swayed by, what, who, you, who you follow, okay, who you listen to, who has a bigger voice in your life, okay? Right now, we got in, in this nation, we got, we got the media controlling a lot of stuff. They, shouldn't be, they should not have that kind of control, okay? They have control over people who are insecure. They have p- control over people who are not putting their faith in God first, okay? So, see, when you do that, you know how to filter those things out, You've learned how to do that. You've got to learn how to filter out. You've got to filter out. There's, there, you, got, you might have to filter out things your parents teach you that don't line up with God's Word. Things you've been taught all your life. Doesn't make it right just because your parents told you it. Okay? You've got to filter that out. Once you, you've got to start thinking for yourself. Right? You can't think, you know, just because somebody told you that's the way it is or the boss told you that's how you're supposed to do things or the media told you that's how you're supposed to do it or certain ministers tell you how you're supposed to do things. If it's not... If it's not agreeable with the Word of God, you better filter that through out, amen, and put God's Word first. Learn how to do that, because if they start controlling your mind, they could, you know, that's what the enemy's after. He wants to control you. The mind is what controls the body. And so that's, that's, that's uh, you know, you've got to set your mind on that. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. The way you think determines who you are. The way you think determines who you are. And I shared the scripture before, Numbers 13, 33, with the giants in the land and the way the Israelites viewed themselves. Okay? And we got a great uh, understanding or revelation from that. So um, where are we at? Oh, you got that. Confusing the speech. Good. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 33. Numbers chapter 13, verse number 33. We saw the giants. These were the people, the spies that came out of, out of um, uh, the promised land. They spied out the land. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. We were like, watch this, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. Like grasshoppers in our own. In other words, that's the way we saw ourselves. We, in our own sight, we see ourselves like grasshoppers. And as a result, so we were in their sight. Okay? Remember what I told you, a revelation I had years ago. The way you view yourself is the way the enemy views you. So how does the enemy view you? Guess what? The way the enemy views you, you determine you determine it. You can determine exactly how the enemy views you. If you view yourself as weak, insignificant, you know, uh, like a grasshopper and, and scared and walking in fear, guess what? That's how the enemy sees you. If you see yourself as an overcomer, child of God, seated in heavenly places, 
with Christ Jesus, amen, an overcomer, a victor, amen. You see yourself that way? That's how the enemy sees you. The enemy sees you the way you see yourself. That's so powerful. That's, a, that's, a, that's an incredibly powerful statement uh, that's in the Word of God, a truth that sometimes uh, some people have missed. Amen? Okay, so, where are we at? God's Word. Talked about it last week. I want to hit on this again a little bit. The Word of God, so powerful. Understand that the Word of God, what we hold in your hand, remember me saying last week that some people relegate it to God's love letter to us, okay? And it's not that it isn't, but it's so much more is what I'm trying to, what, what my point is. It's, just, it's not just, just a little love letter from God. This, this carries weight. And I, and I think this is where many believers as citizens do not realize what they hold in their hand, what is available to them through this book, through this document. This, this is a legal document. You need to understand that. Okay, when you go to court and the enemy's using something against you, you must have something that's legal. Okay, legal. Remember when Paul, last week we talked about the Apostle Paul, when he used his citizenship, he, he, brought, he, he, he brought that forth, and that stopped them from beating him because he used something that was legal. What they were doing was illegal. When the enemy brings about something upon you, you need to understand that's illegal because of your rights as a citizen. They can't do that. And you have a document to prove it. See, you, you know the document. So, see, you have a legal document. The Bible is a legal document of the government of God. Okay? Now, understand that, and this is what's tough for us, as Americans especially. We live in a, we, we're, we're in a democratic society. Okay? That's our culture. Democracy. At least we thought it was. Uh, but anyway, it's supposed to be, okay? So we're, 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 we'll say we've been, raised at, we've been raised in this country with democracy. Then we come into the kingdom of God, and we try to operate the same way. And we don't understand that the kingdom of God is not a democracy, okay? That's where we make a problem. We've got a problem with that. We've got a problem in the churches with that because they, they, they try to govern the church. They try to govern their lives with democracy. They think it's a democracy. So they, they read something in the document and said, Ooh, maybe we'll amend that. Let's come up with an amendment. Maybe if I get enough people to vote, we can change what God's Word says. They do this in the church. We got churches that said, it's okay now. To, homosexuality is okay because it's culturally acceptable, so we as a church need to accept it. So we're going to change the Word of God because this no longer holds weight any longer. You understand? They think it's a democracy. They don't realize it. Hey, you don't have a say in this. It's not up for discussion. It's not up for a vote. You know? See, democracy is a government. It's a government of the people and by the people and for the people. But the kingdom of God is a government of God and by God and for God. You see, there's a little bit of a difference there. It's not, God's government is not democracy. God doesn't say, hey, I was thinking about doing this. What do you all think? Maybe you can all get together and take a vote, and we'll go with whatever you come up with. How many know that doesn't work? How many know if that was what, if democracy was ruling back in the day, how many know the children of Israel would have went back to Egypt? Because the majority of them said, hey, we had enough of this. Let's, get back. Let's just go back to Egypt. We're not going to the promised land. That's democracy. That's not the kingdom of God. So we need to understand that. All right, this is, this is, in the government of God, this is the Constitution. This, is, this Bible is the Constitution. It has been established by whoever, the, a Constitution is established by whoever's in power. This Constitution was established by God. You know why? Because God's in power, okay? It's a contract. It's a legal, written contract document that is a contract between whoever's in power to the citizens. It's a legal document. God made a contract with us, and it's written down, and then He gave it to us so we have the Word of God. Amen? We have it. It's a contract. It's a, it's a legal document. It's a constitutional Constitution, it is a will and testament. 
The Bible is a written will and testament. That's what it is. That's why we call it a test. There's an Old Testament and a New Testament. What is a will and testament? A will is a person's intention. You want to find out what God's intention is? It's here. It's his will. This is it. It's the Word of God, right? What, what's a testament? A testament is the documentation of that will. So if a person has a will and a testament, okay, a will is what they want. It's their intention. A testament is now it's written down. Their intentions have been written into a written down. Okay? Now it becomes a legal document. So see, when you have when you have a reading of the will, all right, it's now their intentions have been written down into a testament. There's no power in that testament, by the way, until what happens? Until the person dies. The testator, the one that came up with the testament, once that person dies, the will goes into effect. It's not into effect. There's no power in it until there's a death. So therefore, when Jesus came to bring the new covenant, see, which was his will, he wrote it down as a testament. No effect until he died. Once he died, then that will went into effect. Does that make sense? Okay? It came about. He had to die in order for his will to come into effect and come into power. Therefore, the New Testament. Then, sometimes people make, make wills throughout their life. They make a will early on in their life, then they have a fallout with somebody, and then they like to oh, cross them off the will. You know, they're not getting that. So they, they do that, you know. And so, you know, by the time you get, you know, they, they pass away, you get into their safe or whatever, and there's their documents, and you look, oh my gosh, they got 10 different wills in here. Ten different, you know, which one do we use? Well, that's already determined in the courts. But you use the most recent one. The other ones are all void. Yeah, null and void. They're no good. You pull out multiple wills, there's only going to be one that, that's going to be legal, and it's going to be the most recent one. So when you're looking at the Word of God and you say, do I follow the Old Testament or New Testament? It's very simple. Which one's the most recent one? That's the one you follow. You follow the new covenant. It's the new will and testament. That's what you follow. Simple. All right? Because he died, but there's two wills. But you follow the new one. Right? Same way in the court system today. And so we begin to understand that. And see, this is the comprehension that we need to have as a believer of what we're holding in our hand. And what, what, what is this? It's not just a nice book of funny sayings and great adages in there and just, you know, good stories. It's so much more. It's a legal document. And see, as a Christian, you need to understand that you're picking up a legal document that's been entrusted to you to use against the enemy. Does this make sense? You need to know what it says, okay? You all need to learn how to be good lawyers. Learn how to be good lawyers. The enemy comes at you, tries to throw something on you. Hey, wait a minute. You know, what do lawyers stand up and what do, they, what do they say? Objection! I object to that. He has no right to do that. And then the judge says, yeah, you're, yep, they're right. According to, the, according to what's in that document, you can't put that sickness on them. You can't, no, you can't do that. They're right. They're citizens. They're entitled to, and, the, and you know, and they rule on your behalf. Does it make sense? Instead, you're, you're, you're in a battle every day. You need to have a legal document. Of what, you need to know what, what, uh, uh, what is backing you, and it's the government of God, backs you as a citizen. But see, people are destroyed because they don't know. Hosea says, my people are destroyed because they, like, they just don't know. I mean, there's, there's people that, that have, they could be right, and they can go to court, but they don't win because they don't know the law. They don't, know the, they don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. They don't know what scriptures to use. And so the enemy's throwing stuff at them, and they're like, oh, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe I am supposed to take this. Maybe God doesn't heal today. Maybe, maybe the gifts aren't for today. Man, I don't know. I don't know, what, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do and what I'm not supposed to do. I don't know what's right. I, I hear what the media's telling me. I hear what, what, what my friends are saying. I, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to believe. Because they don't know. They don't have a Bible. They don't read it. They don't know what's in it. And they wonder why their, their lives are not, why they're not living victorious lives. They don't, because they don't know what belongs to them. 
They never read the document. They don't know what, what the, God's will was for them. That's why the Bible is so important. It's so important that we, that we learn that word of God. It's so important that we know what's in there and we know, and we know how to use it. Amen? Okay, let me, let's uh, talk about in the kingdom of God. Here's something very powerful, um, and we've said it before. Your position, your position is all based upon righteousness. Okay? It's not based on your goodness. It's not based on your good works. It's based on Him. Okay? It's based on your righteousness. Where, where does it come from? Where does righteousness come from, and how do you receive it? Okay? And, I, and I've said it before many times, uh, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with this. I've taught on righteousness here just recently, but righteousness is your position. It comes with the new birth. Okay? It's automatic, in other words. Righteousness is automatic to every believer. It's not something you earned. Okay? It's not something you grow in. You've heard me say this before. Righteousness, there's not levels of it. It's not like faith. Faith has levels. Okay? Uh, you can grow in faith. You don't grow in righteousness. Okay? There's no levels of righteousness. You didn't earn it. You don't get less righteous or more righteous. You just, it's just automatic. Every believer has righteousness, and every believer has the same righteousness because it's his righteousness that comes to you. And you, when you receive him, you receive righteousness. Do you understand that? The moment you're born again, you automatically are righteous. You're declared righteous. You are justified, okay, and, and declared, justified and declared by God as righteous. God's declared that. God says that about you, Okay. He says that he's justified you and declared you righteous. Why? Because he who knew no sin became what? Sin. So that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. Okay? So we, our sin, he took. Okay? He took that, and then he turned around and gave us his righteousness, his perfection. Okay? That's what he did. So we have received his perfection and his righteousness. That's our position. That's what we have. We're born into it. It belongs to us, okay? You don't lose it. You don't grow it, okay? You have the same righteousness as every other believer. Every one of us have the same one. That's what gives us our position, okay, is the righteousness. That's the authority that you have in this world. You need to understand that. The authority you have is all based on righteousness. It says in Hebrews that the scepter of the kingdom is the scepter of righteousness. Mary Beth, find that for me. I think it's in chapter 1 of Hebrews. The scepter of the kingdom. The scepter. You know what a scepter is? It's what the king's held. It represents authority. And it says that the scepter of the kingdom is. So think of scepter as authority. Did you find it yet? Verse 8, Hebrews 1, 8. You loved, no, but to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Your throne is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of the kingdom. Okay? The, the, the scepter of righteousness is the scepter. It's the authority. Okay? Your authority, your righteousness is, is the authority that you have. Okay, you need to understand that. That's where you're, it's, it's based on your position. In order to walk in it is not, again, for believers, it's not about ability. Believers that are, believers, born again believers who are not walking in victory is not, has nothing to do with your ability. It has to do with your mentality. The difference between a believer who's operating in great faith, who's seeing signs and wonders, who, who's, who's walking in victory on this earth, versus a believer who's being defeated all the time and beaten down and, and just uh, def, you know, in a defeated life, the only difference between them is one understands who they are and the other one doesn't. The one that's walking in victory has no more ability than the one who's walking in defeat. They have the same ability. What lacks and what's different is their mentality. It's what they believe. A believer who's being defeated, who's not walking in victory, who's being overcome by bondages and all kinds, of, they have the same ability. Do you understand that? They just, don't under, they just have a, a lack of mentality. They just don't know. 
They don't know any better. They don't know what they have. Does this make sense to you? There's no difference in ability. All, all believers have the same ability. It's whether or not you have the same mentality. So that's the emphasis. See, that's what we emphasize here in the Word. That's a, that's a foundational type teaching that we have here. We're not after ability. You already got that. All power and all authority has been given to Jesus. He delegated that to you. Do you understand that? You already have that. You have His righteousness. I mean, what more could you have? You have, God, you, have, you have Almighty God lives inside of you. There's the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. That same, you got the same thing. You got, you got, you're all anointed. Every one of you have an anointing. Everyone has ability. It's not about ability. It's mentality. It's what you believe. That's the only difference. That's why people seem to have greater ability. They don't have greater ability. They're the same. They just understand it. They have, greater, they have a greater understanding, greater mentality. Okay? They renewed their minds on things of God. Okay, that's so important. That's a foundational thing. That's one of our, uh, we probably have about, um, you know, 80 of these foundational things. That's, um, I don't know how many. But, uh, but that's, that's one right there. That is a major, major foundational teaching that we have here. Right there. Got to understand it. If you can understand it, okay. Mentality, not ability, okay? Ability's already there. All right. People are destroyed like a lack of knowledge, power of speech, ignorance. You know, that kind of goes without saying. Ignorance keeps many from not experiencing the benefits of God's kingdom. Obedience, if you desire the benefit, you must embrace the procedure. You've heard that, right? All right. Okay, praise God. Next section, understand this, okay? I'll skip that one for till next week, maybe. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of words. Heard it said here many times. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of words. Look, let's look what James said in chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse number 2. James 3, verse number 2. It says, we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body. This is so powerful, this, this, this verse. Um, Mary Beth, would you put this in the amplified, please? Amplified version. And let's look at it again. We, for we all often stumble and fall and offend in many things. And if anyone does not offend in speech, in other words, never says the wrong thing. He's a fully developed, he is a fully developed character and perfect man, able to control his whole body and curb his entire nature. If you can, get, if you can understand what this is saying. It's the power of your words. James is saying, here's the measure of a perfect... Uh, uh, if, in order to... The indication of a perfect man is one who never says the wrong thing. This is how powerful your words are. In order, this is showing you the way to reach perfection. This verse tells you how you reach perfection. How do you reach perfection? You say the right thing. So in other words... We also find then, according to this verse, that imperfection is a result of wrong speech. We fall short in lots of areas, James is saying. We stumble. Why? Because we don't say the right thing. See, you've got to put this all together. It has to do with believing, thinking, and speaking. And those three things must come into alignment. That's how we reach perfection. That's how we become more and more like Christ. Okay? By doing what? Believing the right thing. Thinking the right thing. Saying the right thing. Get those three together. And work. That's, as a Christian, that's what we're trying to, that's what we're obtaining. That's what we're doing. 
We're trying to get our speech lined up right. We're trying to get our mind set correct. We're trying to believe the right things. Does it make sense? So those are the things that we're trying to come together. We're growing in these things continually. Will it ever happen? Chances are we won't ever, it won't ever happen in this life. But we still keep obtaining toward it. We still keep reaching for that prize, the ultimate goal of becoming to the fullness of the stature of Christ, right? That's what we're after. Hopefully, we're getting better every year and not digressing, you know what I mean? Because you can digress from those things too. We want to continually increase. We want to continually think better, speak better, believe better. You understand what I'm saying? We want to keep increasing, okay? We want to keep increasing. That's what we want to do. That's how we become perfected. That's how we become more and more sanctified in the things of God. The more we can get our mind in agreement with God's Word. Our speech in agreement with God's Word. What we believe in agreement with God's Word. That's why the Word of God is so vital. Because everything that we think, speak, and believe must be based upon His Word. Does this make sense? Okay. That's what it comes to. That's, that's how we operate in the kingdom of God. Can you see why the, why the kingdom of God is a kingdom of words and why words are so powerful? What you say, why it's so powerful. Psalm chapter 50. Verse 23. Psalm chapter 50. Verse 23. Whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct aright, okay, and actually, in another version, it says, he who orders his conversation aright, I'll show the salvation of God. All right? If you go, uh, let's see here. I think I have the wrong verse written down. Oh, no. Isaiah. Isaiah. I was looking in Psalm. Isaiah chapter 50. Look at this. Verse 4. Watch this. Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned. He's given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who's weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. So not only do we hear as the learned, we speak as the learned. Okay, He's given us that. Does this make sense? Do we also understand, according to Proverbs 18.21, that the power of death and life are where? They're in the tongue. Death and life, power in the tongue. Powerful. Ephesians chapter 4. Twenty-nine. Ephesians four, verse twenty-nine. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption let all bitterness wrath anger clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another even as god in christ forgave you this is emphasis on the mouth. This is the emphasis on your words and what you say and how you say things, okay? So powerful, isn't it? Power of death and life. Now, look at, look at uh, Matthew 26. You see a couple... Matthew chapter 26, verse 
Verse number 73. This is Peter was hanging out when they were, uh, had arrested Jesus. And people were coming up. And, and remember they were questioning Peter and saying, Aren't you, weren't you one of them? Weren't you one of his disciples? Weren't you with that guy? And Peter's like, oh, I don't know the guy. I don't I know. No, you know, he's denying him. Remember, this is where Peter's denying him. But guess what they said? Here's what they found out. Verse 73. A little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, oh, surely you're one of them. You know why? Your speech betrays you. Your speech betrays you. Did you ever get around a Christian and they're like, oh, I love God. I love God. I just live for God all the time. I'm this great person of faith. I'm like, your speech betrays you. Because <laughs> I've heard you talk the way you talk and some of the things you say. You know what I'm saying? Your speech will betray you. It can betray you, you know, in good ways or bad ways. But your speech betrays you. You know, it doesn't take long to talk to somebody to figure out whether they're walking in faith or fear or whatever. You know, you just talk to them a little bit. Just listen to what they're saying, what they emphasize, whether, you know, you can kind of figure them out pretty quickly. Especially, you know, if you ever work with somebody. Uh, that's when it really seems to come out uh, at work. You know, you get around coworkers and things, and you start listening to how they, things they, uh, how they respond to the boss, how they respond to other coworkers, what they say behind people's backs, what, you know, start catching them. Pretty soon their speech betrays them, you know. You can't just hide all the time. Your speech will betray you. Look at Judges chapter number 12. Interesting little story here. Judges chapter number 12. Now watch this. So the men of Ephraim, Judges 12, verse 1, the men of Ephraim gathered together, they crossed over toward uh, Zephram, and they said to Jephthah, why did you cross over to fight against the people of Ammon and didn't call us to go with you? We'll burn your house down with fire. Jephthah said, well, my people and I were in a great struggle with the people of Ammon, and when I called you, you didn't deliver me out of their hands. So when I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my own hands. I crossed over against the people of Ammon. The Lord delivered them into my hand. Why do you come up to me this day to fight against me? So Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead, fought against Ephraim. The men of Gilead defeated Ephraim because they said, you Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites. And among, in other words, there was, a, there was a mixture here. Okay. Now, the Gileadites seized the fords of the Jordan before the Ephraimites arrived. And when any Ephraimite who escaped said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say, are you an Ephraimite? They're trying to figure out who they are, see? No. And then they would say, well, say Shibboleth. They gave him a word to say. And they would say Sibboleth. Because they couldn't pronounce it right. They couldn't pronounce it right. And then they would take him and kill him. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so they were able to separate by their speech. They could tell. Are you who you say you are? Yeah. Well, then say this. And they couldn't say it. See, this is what the enemy does with believers, too. Believers, are, you know, the enemy comes and says, well, what, are, you, are you a Christian? You, you love God? Yeah. Well, then say this. And they say the wrong thing. They speak fear instead of faith. They speak, they speak, the, they speak things that aren't God's Word. They speak things that aren't lining up with the Word of God. They say, ah, gotcha. Gotcha. Got a foothold now. I can use that against you. See, that's what the enemy's looking for. The enemy's using your own speech against you. Do you understand that? One of the dumbest things as Christians that we do to ourselves is we curse ourselves. We speak curses over our own selves. We do it all the time. We continually curse ourselves. We say things, you know, I can't do it. Oh, I'm getting old. Well, it, this is happening. Well, you know, it was constantly, and, and you start looking at some of the things you're saying, and they're curses. They're curses. We curse ourselves with, our, with, with, with sicknesses and pains and aches, and, you know, I'll never be able to do that, or I can't do that, or I'm not good enough. Or that, you know, those are all curses. Those are all curses. I mean, you'd be amazed if you, if you would record your speech and listen to yourself of some of the things you say. I know I am. I know I am. 
I get corrected all the time. I don't need God to correct me. I live with Tammy. I can't get away with anything. She don't allow me to say, I mean, as soon as I, as soon as I open my mouth, she goes, that's a curse. And I don't receive that in Jesus. I said, oh, yeah, 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 I guess it was, you know. But, yeah, you all need a Tammy in your life, I'm telling you. She just, I mean, she holds me accountable, things I say and things, you know, don't say that. What are you saying? She goes, you need to quit saying that about your body. You need to keep saying, and I'm like, and, you know, my, my response is like, like any other human being. Yeah, but that's how I feel. I don't care how you feel. The Word of God says that, you know, you got strong back. You got a strong knees. And I'm like, okay, thank you, Lord. Yep. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. I'm going to say the right thing now. And, and she holds me accountable. I'll tell you what, if, if I wasn't married to Tammy for the last 30 one years. I might be dead. I don't know. I'm serious. I might have cursed myself to the grave by now. Seriously. I mean, you know, first it was my mom, then I got married to Tammy, and then both, <laughs> both of them, I mean, they just don't allow me to say anything. I grew up, my mom wouldn't allow me, I'd say things, my mom, don't you say that in this house. I said, well, I was just saying, I don't care, that's, that's unbelief. We don't, <laughs> don't talk like that, and we don't talk that kind of stuff here, you know. So I was taught that, you know, when I was a teenager, and then I got married to Tammy, and then she continued it, and, uh, you know, I didn't have a chance, you know, so I'm still here. I'm, I'm going to be here a while. As long as Tammy's here, I'm, I mean, we're good. I'm going to be strong and healthy, you know. She won't, she won't allow it any other way, so anyway. Speak the right thing. Um, what's Amos 3 3 say? Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Very powerful. Another one of our foundational things here. Very real simple. And understand how everything operates in the universe that God created. This will be familiar. Can, it's a question, can two walk together unless they're agreed? Of course, we understand it's, it's, it's a question that's, that the answer is no. <laughs> you can't. How do you walk together unless you're in what? Agreement. The power of agreement. The power of agreement is so, is so vital to the church that we, again, it comes down to this. And here's how simple it is. Here, you want to learn how to, how to live a good Christian life in victory and faith and, and be an overcomer? It's real simple. Agree with God. That's it. Sum it all up right there. Just agree with God. Whatever God says, just, I agree. I come into agreement with it. Your word says it, I agree with it. I agree. The power of agreement. How do you walk with God? You can't walk with God if you don't agree with Him. You understand? You have to agree with Him or you can't walk together. So if you're walking with God, you have to be in agreement. If you're in, see, what happens is we become in disagreement with God anytime we do things opposite of the word anything we, we come in there, there's a great scripture I, I linked this together uh, before and let me if I can find it oh what, what is it casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself right 2 Corinthians 10 is that it 10 4 and 5 Okay, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. Okay, so I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this, so, but, but I want to end with it. I want to, I want to get it across. Okay, get this. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to do what? Pull down strongholds. Casting down what? Arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to obedience of Christ. Now, now, there's a lot to say there, but I just want to say this. Casting down arguments. Do you know what an argument is? An argument is a disagreement with God's Word. Anytime you disagree with God's Word, guess what you've now entered into? You've entered into arguing with God. When you go around and confess that you're sick, guess what you're doing? You're arguing with God. You're arguing with Him. When you go around and confess things that, you can't, that God's called you to do, that you say you can't do, guess, guess who you're arguing with? That's an argument with God. That's, that's a disagreement. If God said to do it and you say, I can't, you're now arguing with God. That's disagreement. You can't walk together. You can only walk together when you agree. So see, if God says to do something and you say, I can't do it, 
You've now just disagreed. You've now argued. That's an argument. That has to be cast down. Anytime you find yourself in disagreement to the Word of God, that is an argument with God. Those arguments need to be cast down. See? They need to be cast down and come into agreement with what God says. Does it make sense? Everything on this earth operates through the power of agreement. How does the enemy get anything done? He gets you to agree with him. The enemy doesn't operate on his own. I don't, did you understand that? Everything on this earth operates through a human being. God set, God set man over this earth. When he created man, man has dominion. Okay? Man has dominion. Satan doesn't have dominion on this earth. The only way Satan can gain dominion or have any kind of power is he has to find someone to agree with him. If he can find a human being that agrees with him, that's what empowers him. You understand that? He, can't, he doesn't operate on his own. He has to have humans agree with him. He has to have them come into an agreement with what he's trying to bring. When you come into agreement with him, you're empowering him. Okay? So if you're not agreeing with God, you're automatically agreeing with the enemy. You understand? You can't agree with both. So this is, this is how you walk in victory. You walk in victory by agreeing with God. You walk in victory when you recognize you recognize whenever you're not in agreement with God and now you're in an argument with him and that has to be cast down. You cast down that argument and say, no, not in Jesus' name. That's not what the word says. I come into agreement with what the word says. Does this make sense? This is how, as a believer in the kingdom of God, that we learn to operate with our legal document and what this means and how we must come into an agreement with what this document says and then apply it to our lives through what we believe, what we think, and what we speak. And as we come into agreement with that, we'll continue to grow in the things of God. Does that make sense? Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the opportunity to come here tonight and to look into your word and to come into an agreement with what you say. We agree with you. If your word says that it's true, if your word says that we agree with it, Lord, areas in our life that we're in disagreement, Lord, reveal those to us right now in Jesus' name. Show us where we are out of alignment. Lord, where we're not thinking the right things, where we're not speaking the right things, we're not believing the right things. Lord, show us in our lives where we are falling short. Lord, so that we can repent, change our mind about it, change our speech about it, change what we believe, and come into an agreement with you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Thank you all. Love you guys.